I'm so glad to be here. Um, it's fun. Um, and to prepare for this talk, I've been reading fairy tales. Now, none of the guys here will admit to liking fairy tales, right? Boys don't like fairy tales, right? Until you get to my age, then they're charming. So, well, how many of you like fairy tales? Yeah, okay, so all the girls like fairy tales. Right, well, so there's this wonderful book called Grimm's Fairy Tales, and it's got all the fairy tales that you think you know and love, you know, like, what, Snow White and Cinderella and various stories about frogs turning into princes and other bizarre things like that. But it turns out that the original is better than the Disney versions. Uh, so I'd encourage you to read. This is what's called a, uh, what, what used to be called a book. Uh, I don't know if you've seen one of these before. I had to go to the museum, you know, to pick it up. And, but anyway, um, there's a wonderful story called The Elves and the Shoemaker. And it's not long. So I think I would like to read it very quickly. Um, and I like this one because it doesn't have any strange things like, you know, suddenly a witch just appears in the forest and gives you a poison apple and places a hex on you. Or, uh, what, you know, what's that story that uh, with, uh, is it uh, the girl with the hair, you know, from the movie? Um, Tangled, yeah, Rapunzel or something. So in the original, it's like her father gives up his firstborn child in exchange for a head of lettuce, you know. What is that? Why, why would you do that? So none of those strange things happen in this story. This is just straight out cool stuff because uh, there's a lot, most of the stories in here actually involve merchants. Uh, they involve merchants doing plain things like um, making a table and then buying some jelly and things like that. I mean, just, and you know, what's, what's interesting about the stories that are covered in Grimm's fairy tales, the book came out in 1812. So, um, in 1812, in Germany, commerce was really cool because it was fairly new. There was an emerging middle class, so everybody could become you know, wealthy by the standards of that time. This is the first time in human history this has really ever happened, that anybody could just start a business and, and make a lot of money. So a lot of the Grimm's fairy tales were about businesses because businesses were new. I mean, we think that's just normal, you know. Um, I don't think it's normal, by the way. I think business is brilliant. I was eating at Taco Bell last night. You know, that is a brilliant place, I tell you. you order the Enchirito. Everybody, the poor Enchirito. Nobody orders the Enchirito. It's a great dish. Anyway, I highly recommend it. Anyway, business is amazing. It's not so amazing to us because we're surrounded by it. It was amazing back in 1812 in Germany. So a lot of the stories are about business. Let me read you the story of the elves and the shoemaker. There once was a shoemaker who, through no fault of his own, had become so poor that at last he had only leather enough left for one pair of shoes. At evening he cut out the shoes which he intended to begin upon the next morning, and since he had a good, <laughs> since he had a good conscience, he lay down quietly, said his prayers, and fell asleep. In the morning... When he had said his prayers and was preparing, to, was preparing to sit down to work, he found the pair of shoes standing, finished, on the table. He was amazed and could not understand it in the least. How many of you know this story? Oh, everybody does, but I can read it anyway. <laughs> he took the shoes in his hand to examine them more closely, because there's a lot of versions out there. This is the real version. He examined them more closely. They were so neatly sewn that not a stitch was out of place and were as good as the work of a master hand, and soon afterwards a purchaser came in, and as he was much pleased with the shoes, he paid more than the ordinary price for them, so that the shoemaker was able to buy leather for two pairs of shoes with the money. Now the story leaves out something, right? I mean, clearly the shoemaker raised the price, right? And it's not like some guy came in and said, well, I'm not gonna pay the low price for that, I'm gonna pay a high price, no way, right? The shoemaker saw immediately these shoes were worth more than the usual pair, jacked up the price, which is hers right, yeah, good for him, Sold them at the high price, and the deal was made. So he cut them out in the evening the, with, the, uh, with the shoes that he was going to make. And the next day, with fresh courage, he was about to go to work. But he had no need to, for when he got up, the shoes were finished, and buyers were not lacking. These gave him so much money that he was able to buy leather for four pairs of shoes. Early next morning, he found the four pairs finished, and so it went on. When he cut out at evening and was finished in the morning, 
so that he could soon again, uh, in comfortable circumstances, uh, so that he could soon again, in comfortable senses, circumstances, and become a well-to-do man. So it happened one evening, not long before Christmas, when he had cut out some shoes as usual, he said to his wife, you think he would have said this earlier, <laughs> how would it be if we were to sit up tonight and see who it is that, <laughs> that lends us a helping hand? All this time he's rich, right? He never asked the question, how's this happening? Where are these shoes coming from? He finally just has, maybe, maybe husbands and wives in those days didn't talk much. Or I don't know what. That, but anyway, they decided to stay up that night. They got curious to see what was going on. The wife agreed, at, well, honey, that's a lovely idea. Let's find out who made us rich. And so they hid themselves in the corner of the room behind the clothes, which were hanging there. I mean, why did they think they had to hide? I mean, why not just sit out in the open, you know? But anyway, they hid. Um, at midnight came in two little naked men who sat down on the shoemaker's table, um, took up the cutout work, and began their tiny little fingers to stitch so and hammer so neatly and quickly that the shoemaker could not believe his eyes. They did not stop till everything was quite finished and stood complete on the table. Then they ran swiftly away into the night, little naked elves running through the streets or whatever, I don't know what. The next day his wife said, you know, so uh, what, they said nothing? They just went to bed. The next day his wife said, the little men have made us rich and we ought to show our gratitude. They were running about, about with nothing on and must free, freeze with cold. Now we'll make them little shirts, coats, waistcoats, and hose, and even knit them a pair of stockings and, and shall make them each a pair of shoes. And the husband agreed. And at evening, when they had everything ready, they laid out the presents on the table and hid themselves to see how the little men would behave. At midnight, they came skipping in and were about to set to work. But instead of the leather ready to cut out, they found the charming little clothes. At first they were surprised and then excessively delighted and with great speed they put on and smoothed down the pretty clothes, singing, now we're boys so fine and neat, whatever the song goes, <laughs> why cobble for others' feet or whatever. I'm sure there was another verse that's not printed here. Then they hopped and danced about and leapt over chairs and tables and out the door they went. Henceforth they came back no more, but... It was okay because the shoemaker fared well as long as he lived and had good luck in all of his undertakings. And so goes the story. A wonderful story. And strangely, I think it is a metaphor for understanding economics. And I'll tell you why in the following way. We can think of ourselves as the merchants in some ways. In some way, you know, they were poor. They had nothing. Um, they were struggling to get by as best they could, but they couldn't make ends meet, and they just couldn't get ahead in life. That describes, more or less, the plight of humanity from about the beginning of recorded time until about 1800. That was the way all of history was. Nothing really ever happened at all that suggested that there was going to be any progress ever. If you think about it, if you wanted to get a message from somebody to, from one place to another place, um, any time between, say, uh, um, ancient Greece and the American Revolution, how were you going to do it? I mean, you just wanted to get a message, right? You just wanted, you know, like text. Just get a message to somebody. Well, you had to write it out and run to that person. Or, if you're really wealthy, you could hop on a horse and ride to that person. Or if you had a boat, you could get on a boat and let the wind carry you to that person and get them the message. That was how information traveled for all of human history until the invention of the greatest thing that ever happened up to that point in time, which was the computer. <laughs> yes, the iPad, right, right, no, right. Somebody said telegraph. <laughs> oh, yeah, the wise man. There's a story in here about wise men. Yeah, anyway, um, so yeah, the telegraph was amazing. 
That was the beginning of modernity, as we understand it. That was the beginning of our possibility of sharing ideas with each other, of communicating with each other. That happened in something like 18, what, 20 or something like that. Unbelievable. Up until that time, there was no other way to communicate. So you saw in, in human history, so that doesn't work, right? Um, I'm going to have to describe this chart for you. So this is a chart of income per person throughout history. Uh, it starts in 1000 BC and goes all the way up to here, and it's completely flat. Completely flat. Nothing ever happened. No progress, really, to speak of. And then, in about 1800, we see income per person shoots up, and it goes up to the very top of that chart, just like that. So, isn't it wonderful that you were born, like, over in this tiny little corner of life? instead of any other time over here. I mean, that's kind of fortunate. You didn't really do anything, did you, to deserve that? I mean, I mean, you didn't make that choice, did you? It just sort of happened to you and to all of us in this room. So if you ever feel like you don't have anything to be thankful for, just sit down like that man with a good conscience in the story and say your prayers of thanks for the fact that you were born now instead of at any other time. If, if this was like a random thing, you just kind of threw your life down on this chart somewhere, most likely you wouldn't land here, but you did. So good for you and congratulations. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing because up until that time, life was very, very different. But actually, in fact, well, let me just, let me just explain to you why I think this is significant in light of that story. This um, line, this income up in this tiny little corner here, I think it's good to think of that as being the finished shoes in the morning, right? I mean, this is, this is the, the man working throughout all of life. He wakes up in the morning, he's got the finished shoes. That's what it is. And the question is, who made that? How did this happen? What did you do, really? What did any of us do? Not much. Really, we didn't do anything. We just woke up and found ourselves with this finished pair of shoes. We woke up and found ourselves in this unbelievable, prosperous civilization. And we were laughing a little bit ago about that man and his wife and why it never asked the question, where did these shoes come from? They got enormously wealthy and never occurred to him to figure out who was making these shoes. Well, how often do we ask why we're so prosperous? Why do we have the lives that we have? I mean, most people never ask. They go to the store, they buy something. You go to Taco Bell and order an Enchirito, you know? Hey, it's my right, you know? Um, my iPhone, my iPad, my uh, everything, everything we're surrounded by. Um, the achievements of civilization are all around us. And are we asking ourselves where they come from? Who built it? Are we staying up at night to observe what happens? And that's what economics is all about. It's about the desire to be curious about where all this stuff came from. We should know. We shouldn't just take it for granted. We shouldn't just wake up in the morning and find the shoes and go, that's neat, and sell them, and sit on our riches. We should be curious and ask the question. We should get to know these elves and find out who they are. Let me show you another chart. I can't really show it to you. This is population. It's a very similar chart. It goes from the year 2000 BC all the way up to current times, which our current population is now, I think as of a week ago or so. Who keeps, who keeps track of this stuff? I don't know. <laughs> like last Tuesday or something. Um, Seven billion uh, people on the planet. So here's the line from the 2000 BC up to the present, and it's almost entirely flat. We get a little bit of rise in population increases. Notice that population increases before per capita wealth increases in the history of the world. And then suddenly, in the same period, uh, uh, basically mid-19th mid, mid century, um, late 19th century, um, we go from the lowest part of the chart up to the top of the part of the chart in one gigantic soaring rocket you know, thing of a spike there. Unbelievable. So, in fact, you can see that it's not entirely random that you're born during our times. In fact, most all people in the history of the world were born in our times. I mean, it's, it's quite unbelievable, actually. We look at the population increases. So historians have asked the question, you know, why is this? This can't be an accident. Where do these shoes come from? And do people do that? So I th and there are some conclusions 
that historians and economists have come to that I'll share with you shortly. But let me amuse you with a, some funny calculations The Economist magazine did. Um, if you think about history, what is history? Well, The Economist magazine said, well, hi history is really people. That's, that's really what constitutes it. I mean, is there really history happening if there are no people? Not really. I mean, history, we think of most, history is just people, right? So if you kind of consider that most people have been al uh, that, are, that have ever been alive were born in the last 100 years, and you calculate uh, that according to output per capita, then they concluded that 55% of all of human history happened in the 20th century. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting way to look at it, isn't it? And 25% of all of human history happened in the last 10 years. That's, do you understand what, what they're doing? It's a kind of a trick in a way, but it's brilliant when you consider just how fortunate, how extravagantly we live and how amazing the times we live in. So the question is why? And, and this is where I would like to give you uh, something I discovered, that there's not just two naked elves, that's just wrong. In fact, <laughs> in fact, there are six elves and they are fully clothed at the very outset, you know, so you don't have to imagine naked elves anymore. There are six elves and they have, there are six names. Each one of them has a special name. The first elf is named Private Property. Private property is the beginning of civilization. It's the beginning of prosperity, without which there can be nothing at all of any note that will ever advance our lives in any respect. And the reason for that is that all scarce things have to be assigned an owner because it makes no sense to assign a collective as the owner of any scarce thing. Not everybody in this room can can be in possession of this book simultaneously. You can be in possession of the story I read to you. You can carry that with you, but you cannot take this book. It has to have an owner. And so it is with all scarce things in the world and everything you see around you. Every physical thing is scarce. So, of course, it has to be owned. And it's sheer nonsense to say that everything should be owned by everybody. That really makes no sense at all. And I don't understand how it is that this idea of socialism ever got off the ground. I mean, the first person who came up with socialism should have just been laughed at and said, well, that's preposterous. Why don't you go back to your dreamland? And that would have been it, right? I mean, that idea should have been killed, you know, about, about 5,000 years ago or something. I mean, but anyways, the idea is still around. Um, private property ena enables every kind of human association. Without private property, we can't even get off the ground. The second elf is named the division of labor. And I'm pretty sure Mark talked about this earlier. Now, this is an, a more extraordinary thing than you fully know. Division of labor means our capacity to... Uh, cooperate in a, in a productive exchange with each other. And there's something wonderful about this, about the division of labor. What it means is that everybody, no matter what your abilities are, um, can find a place within the matrix of exchange, uh, can find a productive employment for yourself in society. And you can prove this mathematically, and I wish I had time to do it. But here's the, here's the point. Um, that even if you're kind of like shabby at, at, at virtually everything you do, there's still a place for you within the division of labor. Even if, even if somebody else you know is amazing at, at doing things, uh, a, a million different things, he simply does not have time to do all those things in the course of a day. So he must have assistance. And if you cooperate, uh, people of low skills and people of high skills cooperate, then both parties are better off in the end. And you can absolutely prove this. And this is, this is the, the magic of the division of labor, is that it finds a place for every single human soul in the great uh, productive enterprise of, 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 of global economics. And the more information we have, the more we can communicate with each other, and the more there's private ownership, the more this cooperation, may, may, cooperation is made possible. Division of labor is the beginning of the brotherhood of man. That is the second elf division of labor. The third is exchange, and I think we need to fully appreciate what this means. To exchange, to exchange one with another, it's different from uh, just a pure gift. An exchange is a mutual gift giving, and that happens every time you're engaged in any commercial activity. And I can give you my most recent example, actually. Last night at 10 o'clock, I went into 
Taco Bell with a dollar ninety nine in my pocket. And I looked up at that menu and I thought, is there anything in this menu that's worth to me more than what I have in my pocket? And I looked up and I saw that Enchirito, which brought back memories from childhood. And I could practically taste it. And of course, the picture was better than the reality. Uh, inevitably, but the reality is pretty great. And also, you can't eat a picture, so we don't complain. <laughs> so I said to the lady, I said, listen, I have a dollar ninety-nine in my pocket, but and it's worth a lot to me in many ways, but your Intervito is worth even more to me than what I own. What about you? What's your sense? Is your Intervito worth, I know it's worth a lot to you, but do you think that my money might actually be worth even more than your Intervito? And she said to me, you know, I'm so glad you brought up this point because it is in fact worth more to me than my Intervito. And I said, well, why don't we, why don't we just exchange? And that way you will get a gift of my money, which is worth more than your Intervito. And I will get a gift, which is your Intervito, which is worth more than my money. And she said, that is a beautiful idea. And we exchanged with each other. I handed her the money, and she handed me this little plastic tray of mushy you know, beans. With, um, and we looked in each other's eyes, and I said to her, thank you. And she said to me, no, thank you. <laughs> and it was wonderful. And we were so happy afterwards, so much happier than we were before. <laughs> And if you could repeat this a trillion times in the course of an hour all across the world, what would happen? What would happen? The world would be a very beautiful place. And that is, in fact, what is happening all the time. And that is the source of our happiness. The fourth elf is named risk-taking. And uh, you could also call it entrepreneurship. This is the wonderful thing about the market economy that it enables this tiny percentage of population, these crazy people who just dare to pull back that veil of uncertainty and ask, what is going to happen tomorrow? The rest of us, we're afraid of it. No, not entrepreneurs, they're not afraid of it. They think they know, they think they're, they, they're making a good judgment and they're willing to take a guess and they're willing to put their property at risk to see if their guess, if their judgment, if their dream comes true. They pull back the veil and they step beyond it. And if they're wrong, they lose. And if they're right, they win. And we win. We win because we get to use the products and we get to partake in their dreams. That is a beautiful thing. There might be some entrepreneurs in this room. You have to ask yourself if you're one of them. They are our benefactors. The elves called entrepreneurs are society's benefactors. And they are what drive history forward. They are what give us all the things we love. The fifth elf is called capital accumulation. If you look at poor countries and you wonder why they're poor and they're not rich, even though the people in those countries are smart, productive, trading, exchanging, ambitious, Charming, peaceful, this is, this is true. All over the developing world, people are like this. They are not lazy monsters who don't know how to do anything. They're wonderful people who are very productive and they exchange all the time. So what's the difference between poor countries and rich countries? It all comes down to one word, capital. That means the accumulation of property that is used to make other kinds of property. It is the means by which you produce things. It's, it's the production of things in order to make other things. So that production can take several stages, not just one time. So you're not just making soup to serve for lunch, but you're making the kettles in which the soup can be prepared, and you can sell those kettles. That's called capital. So capital is the difference between rich countries and poor countries. Capital accumulation must be permitted. We must allow people to become rich. We must allow people to become appallingly and filthily rich 
in order to have capital so that it can thrive, so that we can all benefit from it. So that, that's what allows for the extension of production over a long period of time, and it's what allows business firms to hire thousands and thousands and thousands of people and plan far out into the future, because planning is the key to prosperity. The sixth ALF, as I'm calling them, is called, and in some ways, I think it may be the most important ALF, it's called the desire for a better life and the belief that it can happen. Because even if you have private property, you have the possibility of division of labor, you have the opportunity for exchange, you have entrepreneurs that are willing to take risks, and you have the accumulation of capital. If you have a culture in which people do not desire to live better, and they don't believe that it can happen, everything will fall apart. Everything will grow stagnant. And society will collapse. And we will be reduced back to what we were for the whole of human history, which was a groveling, teeming mass of nothings, living hand to mouth, sleeping on grass, uh, and being bitten by bugs at night, by the way, <laughs> which is a very unpleasant thought. That's what keeps me kind of believing in capitalism, is the prospect of being bitten by bugs at night, because um, I don't like that. But um, so if, if you don't believe in the future and you don't believe that you can do this and that you should live a better life, everything will fall apart. So in the end, it all comes down to you, to what you believe about yourself and what you're capable of. And I don't think that times could ever get so bad that there are not opportunities in this world in your lifetime for you to make a contribution, you yourself, to make a marvelous contribution to building civilization. And what else are you here to do besides that? I'm not speaking in a theological sense. We have many jobs, spiritually and theologically. But materially, what are we here to do? We can make a dent in the universe. We can make a difference. We don't, we don't know how long we have to make that difference. But you can be one of them. If you desire a better life, if you desire and you believe that it is possible, you will find the opportunities. You will look for the ways. And you can become that one elf that makes the difference between that couple living in poverty and that couple living in vast riches. Thank you very much.